going to get back into our worship service and song this morning, and uh, our first hymn this morning is Love Divine. It's hymn number 384. It's in our Methodist hymnal this morning. We're going to do the first, third, and fourth verse. Let's all stand. Uh, this morning's affirmation of place. Please remain standing. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God the Father Almighty, in which may be seated. We're going to sing next, Open My Eyes That I May See. It's hymn number 454. We'll sing all verses. 454.
At this time, if our ushers will come, we'll receive this morning's regular offering, and that'll be followed by our building fund offering. You may be seated. Our last song before we turn it over to Brother Steve this morning is He Lives. It's hymn number 310. 310.
we missed a, a little spot in the beginning of the worship service this morning, so but we don't want to pass it up, so good morning. <laughs> it is good to see all of you. Thank you for coming, and, and thank you for being here and being uh, a part of this day, a part of this worship service. It is a joy to be gathered together with you. It is a joy to look out across and see so many smiling faces. And I'm going to tell you, the life of a preacher is all tied up in your smiles. I can tell you that for a fact. And, and when, you, uh, when you can do that, it makes a difference to your pastor. I also took note and, and want to say, uh, well, I pr appropriately so, uh, big thanks to the choir. Uh, it is good to, to look behind you and see there ain't a whole lot of room left in the choir on a Sunday morning. Now, we could probably sneak another man or two in there. But uh, thank you all. For, for being in the choir and, and thank you for singing and thank you for that uh, that leadership. One other little thing before I, I get to this sermon and talk to you about these passages of scripture. There are always times throughout our lives, particularly when you are in the ministry, there are always times that that you see things happen, that things take place along the, the road or along the path to the sermon you're about to provide for your your congregation, you, you always, always trust that God has given it to you and you always deliver it like it belongs to God and, and not to you. But you always look for things as you go along. I guess it's the human side in us all. Uh, but you always look for affirmation. You always look for things to remind you that the good Lord's still working through you and, and doing things. One of the things that, that has happened here that I haven't told you about, but I'm going to tell you about it today just a little bit. Every Sunday morning, uh, or every weekend, I do the bulletin for the Tishomingo Church. I do it at home, and we take it with us, and, and I pick the songs, and I pick what we're going to use for the worship service, and uh, you'd be surprised how often, without contacting Pam, that I get here and find she's chosen the same songs I chose that week uh, to put in the bulletin. Now, that's not, that's not on us, Pam. The good Lord's putting that together, and and uh, I opened the bulletin this morning, and sure enough, there were two songs that I picked for Tish Mingo in our bulletin today, and I promise you I didn't call, or even text for that matter. But, uh, you know, there are times when you look at things, and, and when you see those things, you think, okay, Lord, there's, there's something here, something for someone to hear somehow or another. Your hand. Maybe it's just the songs he wanted you to hear. I don't know. But it reaffirms that. A lot of things that go on in this world and in our lives are not in, under our control. That God is at work in them. And so, just thought I'd share that story with you just a little bit. But I can tell you, I will say this now. This is our, we're into our second year, a little past our second year. And I, I could not begin to tell you how many times the songs were perfect. They were just exactly what we were looking for. Or they were exactly the same ones that I picked. For Tish Mingo. That just reminds you, as I said, the good Lord's taking care of things. And it kind of puts you at ease and it lets you start talking about things before you get to the sermon. That's what that does. So I just wanted to share that with you. This morning we're going to be reading two stories. But they are the same story, but they are in two different Gospels. Uh, to be able to, to bring this sermon out to say all that I wanted to, or what I think the Lord wanted to be said in this sermon, we're going to look at two passages of scripture. We're going to be looking at Mark chapter 6 and John chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, John chapter 6. If you'd like to turn to those passages, it'll be going to be Mark chapter 6 verses 30 through 39. But both of these are the gospels now. Mark chapter 6 verses 30 through 39. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all of the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. 
By this time it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it is already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take more than a half a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and, and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have, he asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said, five and, and two fish. Then Jesus directed to have them all, the people, sit down in groups of, on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven. He gave thanks and he broke the loaves. And he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of men who had eaten was 5,000. And now John chapter 6, verses 1 through 15. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is, the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? (coughs) He asked this only to test him. For he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, It will take more than a half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with pieces of five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is a prophet who has come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to the mountain by himself. May the Lord bless the reading and the hearing of his words. Today we we come again to a a familiar story powerful story so powerful that it's actually found in all of the gospels this story however I would submit to you is is more than just hearing of a miracle or knowing that Christ fed 5,000 people on that day sometimes as we read and as we study the scriptures We are overwhelmed with the miracles or by the miracles of Christ. So much so that sometimes we fail to see those who are a part of the story or or even what God intended to teach us from the text. Throughout this story, there are important words. Words that if we fail to see or words that, that are part of the story or or words that are key to our understanding, words that let us see what was motivating Christ that day, words that if we look at them reveal the heart of God through Christ, words that were meant to teach us as well. There is a lot here beyond the miracle. It's easy for us to to envision what Christ did, the the authority and and the power he possessed. But what about those people there? Those 5,000 men, I suppose, not counting the women and the children. When we read the story, we ought to think more about just than just the miracles. We need to think about 
the 5,000 who were there to see Jesus? What, what was on their minds? Why are they there? What drew them to the hillside? Why were they following Christ? We see the miracle. We see the, the power of Christ. But do we see into the lives of those who came to hear him? What is it? What is it about Christ, about Jesus, that, that made them come? If we read the scriptures, and if we trace the ministerial, of life, ministerial life of Christ to this point, a picture will emerge. A picture of a man who seemed to be in possession of the qualities not always evident in our world, or, or maybe not evidenced enough in our world. Jesus' ministry was a fine success. His work, his words were drawing people to him. Miracles were happening. happening. People were being made well in, in all kinds of ways. There seemed to be a, a certain hope in, in his words, a certain mercy and decency on display, a, a certain compassion, if you will, in all that, that he was doing. I suppose those people that day must have longed for that kind of minister from God. So much so that in today's story we find 5,000 people looking for Christ. Christ before this day had, had already revealed the kind of man he was, the kind of compassionate power that, that he possessed. He had healed a, a bleeding woman, restored a, a girl's life, cast out demons, calmed a storm, let a sin-laden woman touch him, raised a widow's son, given life to a dead servant, healed a, a disfigured hand, healed a paralyzed man, healed leprosy. Those are just the ones we have recorded. I suppose it was those sort of things, these powerful and these compassionate acts that, that were making his words and his deeds so, so believable, so valuable that people were looking to, to find him, to see him, to hear him. It was such things as these the people saw and heard that made them come to him, I think. It was the kind of work that was transforming their lives and the people's understanding of God and how he wanted to work in their lives and work in their world. His work was popular among the people for all of the right reasons. The most important of these being that they were learning from Christ that no matter who they were, no matter what their condition, their lives mattered. Their God knew their suffering, and it mattered to him. God knew the challenges and, and the issues that were a part of their lives, and they still mattered to him. For many, that is a reason to pay attention, to listen, to follow, to believe. So the time came when because of his ministry and his words, Jesus found 5,000 people who was trying to find him. They were, they were so hungry, weren't they? They were hungry for that moment. They were waiting to see and, and hear from him once again or, or maybe for the first time. But in their, in their rush to see him, in their excitement and delight to, to be with and before Christ, they, they'd lost time of the time of the day and, and where they, they should have been. They should have been thinking about themselves and, and feeding themselves. I imagine that there were some in that crowd who would have, who have gone hung, hungry in order to just be where he was. Jesus saw them. He knew the time of day. He knew that he could send them home and tell them to return tomorrow. There were other options, easy options that would have worked. 
options that would have placed the, the burden of feeding themselves on each of them. But he saw how they had come with no regard for the time of day. I, I think he understood how they were growing to be fixed on his words. He had seen in them a, a hunger for something more than just food for their stomachs. So rather than send them away, he used this opportunity. He used this opportunity to demonstrate God's power. Of course, before he could, he had to deal with man's disbelief, even among his own. Philip said, Lord, it will take a half a year's wages to buy for all those folks, and, and even then it's not going to be enough to feed them all. Andrew said, Lord, we, we got some loaves and some fish, but how far can that go? John said it was a test and that Jesus knew all along what he was going to do. Seems John believed Je Jesus did it just to teach them something, to test them, if you will. It would, it would take a miracle to get this done. But they'd seen Jesus do so many miracles before. Why would they even doubt the, the power of God now? It is just hard, isn't it, for us not so divine folk to believe what God can do sometimes, isn't it? But Jesus showed them once again what faith and trust in God could bring. You take what you have, folks, and, and, and you use it. Then you give God the glory and you thank him for it. And in turn, God blesses it and does miraculous things. It was last November, somewhere about there. Maybe sooner, I don't, I don't remember for sure. But I just remember Sunday night conversation or Wednesday night conversation. I don't even know what night it was. It was Wednesday or Sunday one. Out on the steps of this church. We just talked about starting a youth group. We didn't have but two kids. No one knew how God would do in that. But you took the two kids you had. And you started. You gave it all to God and God blessed it. There was 25 there this Wednesday night. By the way, I want you to know they're not counting it right either. Jacob and Hannah were there too and I don't think they're counting themselves. So we're counting at 27. They get there in an old blue van, and they get there in an old beat-up minivan, Lord of mercy. I've named my minivan Gertrude, by the way. Uh, they're gonna be, we're going to name it the Gert and see how long they can keep going in that van. But just two kids and some old vans. God's doing great things. We all know what happened. They were all fed and, and there were leftovers. The response of the people was as impressive as the miracle was. The people believed that Jesus was special, a, a special gift from God, a prophet, as they said, had, had come into their world. Yes, it's a wonderful story. But don't let the miracle cause you not to see all of the story. There was a hungry crowd there that day. They were at a time and a place they were hungry, if, if not starving, both physically and spiritually. They were a witness to what faith in God can, can do in their lives. They heard and they saw things that reminded them of Christ and by extension God's compassion and, and care for each and every one of them. 5,000 men were there. And they were hungry, and Christ fed them. But I tell you, he fed them more than bread and fish. But as important as that was, I think Christ taught them yet another lesson. Maybe this one more for those who followed him as disciples, as Christ's partners in the ministry. Jesus took what they had. and It wasn't much. But he did something good with it. 
The disciples needed to see that. They needed to learn that. Don't sell your God short. Use whatever it is that you have. And the Lord can make you do mightier things than, than you think. There is much to be learned here, isn't there? Wonderful things if, if we believe them. This story contains so much for the church, things that, things that we need to hear. But not only hear, but, but put into practice. Well, this isn't just a story, it's a lesson. It's a teaching moment given to us by God, a teaching that, that we should apply. There are many. There are many who are hungry out there. Many that I, I truly believe would like to hear a word of, of hope and inspiration. Many whose lives are a bit of a mess, unrewarding and difficult at best. They live day to day through life as best they can. But there are deep, inner things not being touched or ministered to as well. They, they lack the faith they need to, to find any peace and, and assurance that their lives matter to someone else, let alone uh, to God. There are those today who are hungry, and they know they need the, the nourishment that only our God can provide them. And then there are others who will never admit that they're hungry for it, but they still are hungry for it. Yes, I, I believe that they are out there. Maybe they are within reach of my voice this, this morning, at this very moment. They are out there and God sees them. He sees them just as Christ saw the crowd. He looks upon them with compassion and longing. God did not create any human life that it would be lost. He created all human life so that he could be loved by them and they would love him in return. I wonder, I wonder how many of them know that. I wonder how many of them know that they are important to God. I wonder how many of them know that our, our God wants to feed their hungry souls. I wonder how many of them know and understand that no matter where they are or the things that they have done, I, I wonder how many of them know that they are never far from God's thoughts and certainly no distance from God's heart. Don't we wish, don't we wish Jesus were here to speak to them? Don't we wish they were here so that he could feed them? Don't we wish he was here so that he could touch them and heal them? Of course, he isn't here, not, not physically at least, but his Holy Spirit is. You know, it's the one that's living inside of, uh, of you and me. It's that little voice down deep in your soul reminding you and me you give them something to eat. You have all you need. You feed them and don't worry. I'll bless it. Maddie Baddock penned these words. Christianity is, is not a voice in the wilderness but a life in the world. It is not an idea in the air but feet on the ground. A life going God's way. Nothing that we can say to the Lord, no, no calling him by great or dear names, can take the place of doing his will. We may cry out about the beauty of eating bread with him in his kingdom, but it is wasted breath and rootless hope unless we plow and plant in his kingdom here and now. Lord, we know Maddie is right, but, but Lord, what do we feed them? What can we say to them? that will draw them to you now as those were drawn to you that day on the hillside. What would Jesus say to us? 
What instruction or advice do you think he would offer up to us? I'll tell you what I think. I'm the preacher, so I'm supposed to. Treat them as you have seen and read of me treating others. Minister to the sick. Feed the hungry. Shelter the homeless. Show mercy. But most important of all, never lack compassion. That isn't hard. That doesn't take much. But you don't have to have a whole lot to do a whole lot for God. You take what you can and do with it what you can. And the God we serve will bless it. I'll tell you what I think. I think all of us Pastors and parishioners alike. I think all of us would do well to look inside ourselves and, and add ourselves. We need to examine who and, and what we are. We know we are the redeemed. We know we are the children of God. We know we have been blessed. We know there was a time when a compassionate and loving God reached into our lives and he made us new. You know, I, I don't think the world needs any more from us than what we already have. It just needs the truth. It just needs to know about a compassionate and loving, compassionate and loving God who fed our souls. He had the food we needed. He had the nourishment that sustains us. He offered it to us, and, and we took it, and, and it made us all better. It gave us uh, assurances, and it gave us eternal hope. So this is what I would say to you. Just let your heart be like Christ's heart was. Let it be filled with compassion for people. For people who are hungry for something that only Jesus can provide. Our closing hymn. This morning, the, I'd like to say to you that our altar is open to you. We encourage you to come for any prayer, for any need that you have. I would also like for those who can hear my voice this morning who can see us on the radio station or on the TV station I want you to hear that there is a Christ who who wants to nourish you who wants to feed you who wants to know your life always matters our closing hymn this morning if you'll turn in your Methodist hymnal to page 389 we're going to sing freely freely all the verses. Mm -hmm. 